hold on. What exactly are we doing here? Listing historical parallels, constructing prophecies after the fact, seeing faces in the clouds? The more skeptical of you may have detected the seeds of a hyperstition in the first episode. The invocation of mystical forces, the arousal of numinous feelings, and the revelation of an alien order of time, encrypted by coincidences. Hyperstitions are a subversive type of self-fulfilling belief, blending prophecy with disinformation. Like superstitions, they involve false beliefs, but unlike them, they are intentionally designed to engender real-world effects via social contagion. They can be thought of as the cognitive version of a computer virus. Hyperstitions are a product of the engagement of radical philosophers with the theories and discoveries of psychiatry and psychology in the late 20th century. The term's originator, Nick Land, built upon the work of postmodern critical theorists like Foucault, Deleuze and Guattari, who adapted the discoveries of psychiatry to pioneer fields like schizoanalysis, decades before online marketers started doing the same thing with neuromarketing to design more seductive algorithms in their race to the bottom of the brainstem. Hyperstitions, psychographics, neuromarketing, these are the methods of advertising and disinformation, how commercial and political interests hijack the search for meaning. Spooky aesthetics aside, my content will be neither an instruction in nor defense against these dark arts. The internet has enough deranged content on it already. That being said, I'm starting these videos with a disclaimer for good reason. Topics like numerology, astrology, and religious symbolism are deservedly infamous for restructuring the unconscious of people who invest too much significance in them, leading them to identify more apparently synchronous phenomena in their daily lives than are actually worth noticing. Superstition is especially dangerous in the realm of propaganda, if for no other reason than that the suspension of disbelief leaves one open to suggestion. So let's return to reason with Immanuel Kant and his three big questions. What can I know? What should I do? And what may I hope? Let's start by examining the order of these questions. Kant's questions are implicitly asking after three essential properties, the possible, the worthwhile, and the credible, or trustworthy. Notice how each of these properties logically fold back into the previous one when read back to front. The credibility of a person or thing essentially rests on it being worthwhile, literally worth one's time, and only that which is believed to be possible is typically regarded as being worthwhile. The ordering of these questions seems to suggest some innate relationship between ethics and epistemology, or between the good and the true. The ordering of the questions also corresponds, when read front to back, to the three stages of any rational, deliberate act, that is, some description of matters informs a prescription of action, which in turn motivates a course of action. The last word of these questions, hope, is the most peculiar one here, given its suggestion of associated terms like optimism, confidence, and faith. So what can we know to begin with? A philosophical way to approach this set of questions would be to alter the sequence by adding a fourth meta-question to contextualize the other three. A meta-question is a question asked about a question, or in our case, a set of questions, to help get to the heart of the matter. Plato, the ancient Athenian founder of Western philosophy, provides us with such a question in his late dialogue, The Timaeus, written 2,000 years before Kant and the Enlightenment. Namely, What is that which always is and has no becoming? And what is that which is always becoming and never is? Or to put it more simply, which things are permanent and unchanging, and which things are temporary and undergoing constant change. This question helps guide Kant's line of inquiry by dividing the category of the possible 
derived from his first question, into the physical, which is ever-changing, and the ideal, which always is. Just a brief point of clarification. The ideal in philosophical discourse is, confusingly, also referred to at different times as either the forms or the ideas. This is because the terms ideal and idealism ultimately derive from Plato's original use of the term idea in his theory of forms. For a summary of the theory of forms, follow the link in the description box below. Without getting into the semantics, these three terms basically refer to the same thing, at least in their original Platonic context. Given that Plato's use of the terms idea and form differ from the now commonplace, non-specialist meanings of these terms, and that adherents to his theory are called idealists, I'll be sticking with the term ideal for simplicity's sake. The ideal is a difficult concept to define, mostly due to its relationship with the only somewhat less difficult concepts of reality and potential. For now, it will suffice to capture the gist of it. At a minimum, we can say that the ideal must, by virtue of it being defined as unchanging, refer to that which survives death, ergo, that which transcends the confines of a particular time and space. It is this unchanging nature of the ideal which grants it the status of being a perfect blueprint as compared with the imperfect and impermanent imitations of such blueprints we encounter in the natural world. It is also this unchanging nature which associates it with myth, religion, and other long-standing cultural traditions. In less lofty language, the ideal is the same thing as when a phrase like time-tested truth or eternal verity is meant literally, in absolute terms. Of course, our understanding of the physical world has radically transformed over the past century with the rise of quantum physics. The philosophical meaning of the physical, however, suffices for the purpose of explaining how the ideal was originally defined against it. Philosophically speaking, the matter of materialism means something like the visible stuff of the physical world, whatever that is, which is known to all. The ideal, by contrast, was defined as that which is less readily apparent, as that which is known, or at least understood, by comparatively few. We can now see why Plato's question is unique when added as a fourth to Kant's questions. Firstly, it's the only question about time, or in philosophy speak, it's a tensed question, unlike the prior three, which are tenseless. Secondly, it's the only question referring outward to the world, rather than inward to the self. Whereas Kant's questions refer to the ethical and epistemological dimensions of truth and goodness, Plato's question adds the ontological dimension of being and becoming. In the Timaeus, Plato elaborates on the esoteric insights which he derives from this distinction between the temporality of the physical on the one hand and the eternal nature of the ideal on the other. The Timaeus was the work of Plato's which Jung most referenced over his career, having engaged his imagination since at least the 1920s. It therefore serves as the key text for unlocking the meaning of Platonic thought in Jung, as we will discover in the next chapter. By way of analogy, we could say that Plato's ideals are like a special, eternally protected kind of divine intellectual property, originating with and belonging to the universe itself, which, owing to constraints imposed on us by our human nature, we can only hope to make imperfect copies or knockoffs of. For good or ill, the platonic form of the good is therefore associated with things like stability, equilibrium, or in the provocative terms of philosopher of science, Karl Popper, arrested change. It's important to note here that even if one ultimately judges that the category of the ideal is an illusion, it is intended to point towards something more than the merely imaginary. Questions of the imagination, such as its powers, limits, and relationship to reality, will return in later episodes when we discuss Plato's philosophical descendants, the Neoplatonists. Neo just being the Greek prefix for new. 
If there is one perennial theology, or at least one philosophical undercurrent connecting the big three Abrahamic faiths of the West with philosophical antiquity, it would be Neoplatonism. These perennial influences explain why Platonism, and the schools of thought associated with it, feature so prominently in Jung's psychohistory. We can turn to Shakespeare's sonnets for a more vivid, if also a more cynical, sense of the ideal's appeal as against that of mere matter. One could say that the ideal is that which Shakespeare strives after in his 64th sonnet, with his yearning to preserve the beauty of his beloved against those things of beauty which are, by time's fell hand, defaced. Or we may refer to the following sonnet 65, where he desires to immortalize his love itself, such that in black ink my love may still shine bright. Such poetic language seems to make intuitive sense, but it does involve something of a contradiction. How could Shakespeare, or anyone else, yearn to attain an ideal state, or produce an ideal creation, when the ideal is defined as something existing outside of time and space, and therefore, by definition, not something which can come into being. This contradiction speaks to the controversy at the heart of the debate between idealism and materialism. The debate revolves around a central question. Do ideas pre-exist and give rise to the material world, or does matter pre-exist and give rise to the world in which ideas emerge? This is arguably the central question in philosophy, given its potential political, religious, and scientific consequences. It may strike you as a ludicrous, pre-scientific kind of question at first glance, but then consider, with the Platonists, that numbers and mathematical equations are themselves some kind of entity that certainly do appear to have an objective existence, independent of the perception or other activities of human beings. In any event, Plato's ideal is defined against the ever-changing natural world of mortality and death, and this world, the world of being and becoming, certainly does have a history. For example, for the great majority of human history, death claimed not just all living creatures, but most of our cultural creations as well. It's only very recently, around the middle of the 20th century, that a mountain or river may actually have less chance of survival than a digitally preserved work of literature or a vat of chemical waste. The historical timing of Ion's release, during this very mid-century apocalyptic shift in scientific power, can help us understand the book's historical outlook as well as its peculiar genre. To the intellectual climate of 1951, at the dawn of the Cold War and the nuclear arms race, We will return in the next chapter.